Have a beef with something you heard? Looking for a little extra side dish? Let us know on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at The Feed Podcast. Well, we had to get to this subject at some point. We're a show about chefs and restaurateurs and the food industry, and all we've been reading about the last six months has been the sexual harassment situation in the industry. A lot of it well, was— Well, and not just in the restaurant industry. Oh, in everywhere. Pretty much every everywhere, industry. right. <laughs> and we're going to talk, actually, today to the journalist on in New Orleans who broke right. the story about John Besh. But before we get to that— um, I'm just curious. You know, some of these restaurant groups I've read about don't even have mm-hmm. human resources departments. I don't understand that. that at all. So th- there's a lot of different kinds of restaurants. And um, I grew up in a family restaurant. And even though we've got six restaurants, I kind of feel like that we still run ours like a family restaurant. And these are not issues that um, I grew up with. Because in my family's restaurant, we had about half men and half women, which I think is a really important thing. And we had many different generations. So there was always the older generation to protect the younger generation. Now, that's not what you see in a whole lot of the restaurants and the groups that we've been talking about. They tend to, it tends to be a a young person's game and it tends to be male dominated. And that I think we can always say is not a great, a great way of putting together a healthy group of people, okay? So how do you set that tone from day one? Because I have pretty much zero experience in your world. Right. But when someone comes in as a new hire, Mm -hmm. how do you... Is there like a handbook or is there like a, like do you say, is there somebody that you can go to if any issues come up so they feel safe and they feel like? Well, we've had an HR person forever um, because we felt like that was really, my wife was that person in the early days of our restaurants. And then we had somebody that just naturally emerged from our group that was the protector, basically. And we've and taken people that. people felt they could go to that person. Absolutely. And, be, and they do all the time. And they don't like somebody, the way somebody talked to them, or they don't like something about their job or the workplace or whatever. We've got somebody in place that can really help those people. So I, I, I have always wanted to have a really respectable place that that everyone could feel they could thrive and that they it wasn't a bad atmosphere in our place. But the one thing that we have to think about is the development of restaurants because the restaurant culture that we have in the United States basically like, like excuse me basically came out of France and in France it was directly adopted they were directly adopting the French military style because they were going to be taking in 14 year old boy apprentices and they treated them just like they were in the military then that came over to the u.s basically i think you could say because most of the early culinary schools were all based on that french model and they really wanted to have it be very militaristic um and sometimes i mean you know about the military it's not necessarily a great place um for human resources uh situations either but then it, we we changed and we went into this period Period where the restaurant being a restaurant chef was all about art and that came about in the 70s and it was the era of Alice Waters and her friends and people like that that wanted to show that they were really artists and then in the early 90s everything switched and with the the advent of Bourdain and his early writing and the chef was the bad boy and yeah. he's acknowledged that by, by the way from Kitchen Confidential that yes. he maybe takes some responsibility for making and that kind of a glamorous people like David Chang just represented that and then all of the culinary shows on TV glorified that sort of thing and that is, to me, the seeds that we are reaping the the benefits of these days because it was a really pretty rough period. It was hard to live through for me because we would get young hires in that wanted to be that way. And we were like, no, that's not the way we run this business. And so there is, it's something that has to change. It yeah. absolutely has to change. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yep, coming about today's show, the issue of sexual harassment in the food and beverage industry. We're going to talk with a reporter in New Orleans who broke the John Besh story, then speak with two women, both of whom are chefs working within successful companies, one in Chicago, the other in New York City, and hear from them about what they feel the industry needs to do to right the ship. Stay with us. 
This is The Feed Podcast. I'm Steve Delinsky, a food and travel reporter at ABC7 News, the Chicago Tribune, and Canada's Globe and Mail. And I'm Rick Bayless, the chef and owner of Chicago's Frontera Grill, Topolo Bumpo, Choco, Leña Brava, and host of public television's Mexico, one plate at a time. And every week, The Feed takes a deep dive into the world of professional chefs, restaurateurs, food artisans, and drink experts sharing their stories and uncovering their passion for food and drink. But that's not all. Rick and I are always traveling the globe for our jobs, eating, drinking, and immersing ourselves in the local culture. And if you find something exciting along the way, you can be sure it's going to find its way here to our James Beard Award-winning podcast. Well, as we've certainly read with alarmingly too much frequency the past few months, sexual harassment is running rampant in the restaurant industry and apparently has been for some time. It can permeate all levels of interaction. It could be coworkers making inappropriate comments or touches. It could be managers soliciting favors or unwanted touches from guests. We're living in a time when restaurateurs are demonstrating that they will not tolerate such behavior and are firing high-profile chefs for their actions. This is a positive move, but it's only a first step. We've got three guests on today's show, each bringing their unique perspective that we hope can shed some light and continue to push things in the right direction. Our first guest has been a longtime journalist in New Orleans for the past two decades. Brett Anderson has been a writer at the Times Picayune and in 2012 received a prestigious fellowship at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard. Following Hurricane Katrina, Anderson wrote about the role of restaurants in a disaster struck area, how the BP oil spill affected the food supply, changing the experience of iconic restaurants when oyster shuckers no longer had oysters to shuck and instead found work as part of the cleanup crew. Last year, Anderson tackled the problem of sexual harassment in the food industry, publishing a story that Eater credits for being responsible for, quote, the watershed moment of 2017, unquote. Anderson spent months investigating, building relationships with sources, fact-checking, and making sure the story was correct, and in October, reported that more than 25 women had reported sexual harassment from John Besh, the renowned chef, TV personality, and owner of more than 10 restaurants in New Orleans, Not only that, but that the harassment had permeated the culture of Besha's restaurant group on all levels. Anderson's expose has had ripple effects in New Orleans and across the country. Here to tell us more about this experience and what he's been seeing since then is Brett Anderson. Brett, welcome to the show. Welcome. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So take us back to last year. You spent eight, nine, ten months researching this um tell us how it came to light how it came to your attention and what you did once you got um, some of this information well the first tip that i got actually came as it happened um during mardi gras 2017 um at a parade uh in my neighborhood called the coup de vue parade which actually just happened this year's version just happened so it was exactly a year ago when i got a tip from a friend that a, a woman who had worked at the John Besh restaurant group in its corporate office had quit her job, and and the way he the way I remember it is that he basically just suggested that I might want to look into it, and um, and I did. I got in contact with the woman, and she told me that she had quit her job because the sexual harassment was too hard to bear, and she. I ultimately saw an email that she, a resignation email that she had sent to the the executives at the company, including John Bash, and um, and from there, I just I, I just I felt like I wanted to know what was going on, you know, and and um, and I started making phone calls, and it just sort of snowballed. What were you surprised most about? Here was a guy. I mean, Bash in New Orleans is sort of like I don't know. He's the iconic local guy. Um, Mm-hmm. Had you had any indication of this beforehand? Was this a total shock? Well, I, you know, um, what was what was new to me, what was shocking to me, was um, I, there were so many things that I learned that I hadn't really given a lot of thought about to previously. W- one is the role of a. Um, Human resources director, for instance. <laughs> I mean, I you know they, the the company did not have one, and um, my early sources sort of emphasized that, and it didn't really strike me as something that was particularly interesting until I got much further into the reporting and realized that one of the reasons that so many of these these employees and former employees of the Best Restaurant Group were were, if not eager, open to talking to me 
was because they didn't have anyone in the company to go to. And, um, I, you know, the, the consequences of that turned out to be quite profound for the company and for the people who worked there. Um, and, you know, another surprising thing was just that how many of these women had described life working in the service industry as one in which they went to work expecting to be disrespected. And it was so normalized for them that they, while they spoke to me about their stories, they didn't have any real hope that anything was going to become of all of this. They didn't, I think most of them did not really think that the story would ever see the light of day. And they did not think that people who they saw as all powerful would ever um, be held to account. And um, I don't know, it it opened my mind to a sort of world that I hadn't imagined my way into before. And as someone who's covered restaurants for pushing 25 years now, (laughs) you know, that all shocked me in a lot of ways. Um, As for whether or not, you know, it was shocking that this was John's company, I mean, I... One of the yeah, I guess uh, one of the things that's uh, sort of come to my mind as I've thought about this over and over again. Um, obviously, John Besh and his uh, restaurants are iconic uh, to in the United States and certainly in New Orleans. But um, I wondered is is what you uncovered in the Besh group? Um, do you think that it's rampant all through the restaurant world in? in New Orleans? Uh, what have you heard about since then? Is there a lot of that going on? Is there any of the restaurant groups that we uh, that would come to mind for us that um, seem to be run in a very different way? Well, I, I, I can tell you what I know, which is given how many restaurants there are out there, you know, it's somewhat limited. Um, I, it, I, it has been my experience since I wrote this story um, you know, I, a lot of people have come forward to me in the restaurant industry wanting to talk to me about their experiences or just talk to me generally about the topic of, of sexual harassment in the restaurant industry. A lot of these people are saying to me that what they read in my story was not surprising to them. And that they are suggesting to me that this is a problem that has existed for a long time in restaurants and... Um, and, and that exists in a lot of restaurants. You know, I, 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 it's hard. I don't work in restaurants, and my reporting on this particular subject, while it has occupied a lot of my time over the last year, is still limited. You know, I mean, I, I think that there are um, restaurants that are run, you know, with great integrity that people really enjoy working at. I know that from my reporting. Um, but a lot of the folks that I am talking to are suggesting to me that they believe that this is a problem that is rampant throughout the industry. I can say that. And then last question, Brett, just what, what's happened mm-hmm. in the last uh, month or so that you, I know you continued to work on this story and advance it. Uh, where, where is it right now? Well, right now it is, there is a lawsuit that is not directly related to the sexual harassment issue, but that arose out of the reporting between John Dash and Alon Shaya, who is a very well-known chef here in New Orleans and worked in the John Dash restaurant empire. He's a James Beard award-winning chef like John himself. And um, just before my story came out, um, the best group fired Alon, somewhat surprisingly. And that has prompted a a, a legal battle over the trademark of the Shia restaurant, which is, you know, a couple of years ago, won Best New Restaurant in the Country Game Field Award. It's a very, you know, one of the more successful new restaurants to open in New Orleans in, in the entire time I've been. And so that legal saga is playing out. Um, the, there have been a, two more EEOC complaints um, that I have become aware of that have been filed against the restaurant group. Um, there were people who were in my story filing complaints that they had shared with me previously, but they just um, sort of formalized those complaints by making a, um, a filing with this legal agency. Um, and otherwise, I have been um, just, a, a lot of people have come forward to me, as I just explained to Chef, um, in the local community wanting to speak to me about the experiences that they have had working in restaurants and not just with at the BRG restaurants. Nothing has, nothing blockbuster has happened from, you know, has, 
has resulted in those conversations, but but they're ongoing, and um, I sort of feel an obligation to keep an open ear, and um, and that's that's pretty much where it stands. Well, listen, we uh, appreciate your time today, and you've done a lot of work uh, uh, working this story down there, and I know it's been a long slog, but um, hopefully we're getting to improve the situation, and your reporting just keeps bringing things to light, and we'll continue to look for your stories, uh, both in the Times-Picayune as well as at NOLA.com. Brett Anderson's a reporter and critic at the Times-Picayune in New Orleans. You can read his work at NOLA.com. Brett, thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Coming up next, the pastry chef for The Publican in Chicago stops by to talk to us about the story she wrote recently for Food & Wine magazine. Then later, the chef and owner of Dirt Candy in New York City talks with us about her online essay that ricocheted around the industry. Stay with us. listening to the feed podcast get the inside scoop by following us on twitter at the feed podcast arrive at the meal late check out previous episodes get recipes from ingredient challenges and see behind the scenes pictures at the welcome back to the show everybody you may know dana cree from her brilliantly depicted gorgeously illustrated book hello my name is ice cream or maybe from her two james beard nominations for outstanding pastry chef Or perhaps you've seen her blog, The Pastry Department, which you can find at thepastrydepartment.com. Or if you live in Chicago, you might have noticed she's the executive pastry chef at The Publican. What ties these accomplishments together is Cree's dedication to meeting problems head on. In 2005, she worked in a one-woman department at a wine bar in Seattle, where without a mentor to guide her, she taught herself how to use flavors and techniques to create a dessert menu. Working in the tiniest of kitchen spaces at Avec and Blackbird, she figured out how to execute delicious desserts. She then decided to start the Pastry Department blog, where she and others in the pastry departments across the country share their stories. In Cree's words, the blog is, quote, for the younger version of myself, that wide-eyed girl making the untethered leap into her first pastry chef position, and for anyone like her pushing forward into pastry careers of their own. For that wide-eyed girl and for all of us, Cree has asked us to consider different solutions to another problem in the kitchen, sexual harassment. In her recent essay for Food & Wine magazine, It's Not Actually Funny, she asks some important questions. How can we change the culture so that the default way to connect with coworkers and initiate newbies is not to joke about sex and not to suggestively touch each other? One way to lead this change, she writes, is to respond to sexual harassment as it's happening by saying, quote, that's not actually funny. Today, we are very pleased to have Dana Cree back on the show. Dana, welcome. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. So last time you were here, we were talking about ice cream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the, what you wrote. How did this, first of all, come about? You wrote something online, and then Food & Wine talked to you about something else? Yeah. So the John Brash story broke, and um, I think it really cracked open uh, experiences that I had been building in me for 18 years of career now. Um, and the thing that I realized for me was that even as a woman who has been a victim in the past, like there was part of the culture that I was participating in as well. And that was the joking. And, uh, for all of my career, you know, we all read Anthony Bourdain's book and the celebrated humor of kitchens is no holds barred, crass, dirty, sexualized humor. And you know, joking about everything else as well. And that really fueled a lot of the kitchens that I worked in. And I think for me, I, the first thing I had to do if I was going to have any part in a conversation moving forward was stand up and say, like, me too. Like, I did this too. I made these jokes. I laughed at my own gender. I laughed at other people of color. I laughed at everything. And I made jokes about everything. And It doesn't matter if I'm a woman. It doesn't matter if I'm a man. Like, I need to stand up and say, I participated. It's not okay. And I want better for us. Wow. That's um, that's really courageous on your part, I think, to be able to stand up and say that. Um, As we are talking about all of this and it's all unfolding, um, the thing that keeps coming back to my mind is um, how can we as a as a uh, a restaurant industry 
adopt <clears throat> different things in our kitchens that will help to right the boat, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that just saying it's not funny or just saying that's not right for, for us to be doing or talking about here in our kitchens is enough? Is that, is, is that going to right the boat? Or do you think that there has to be something else? Well, I think that there have to be very different changes at different levels. It's not enough for an HR department to just say, hey, guys, that's not funny. Like, right. they have to put um, protections in place. Then they have but to... what kind of protections are you thinking about? Uh, they have to put um, wording and language in um, employee handbooks mm -hmm. that say specifically, like, what is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Then they have to train their managers on how to recognize situations and how to deal with them as they come up and how to properly utilize the company's protocol and um, when to bring it to an HR person and let them start to handle a mm -hmm. situation. And then they have to train their employees on how to use those systems as well of reporting. Um, one of the very first things I did, because it I work for a company that has had a HR department in place for since my uh, time with them, um, which has been about seven years. Um, I can't speak to before that because I wasn't there. And one of the very first things that I did when all of this came out was write an email to my cooks and make sure that they understood what would happen if they reported it, like how it would be approached. I made sure that they knew I was available I made sure that they had the email of the HR person so that if they wanted to contact her anonymously and privately, they had that access mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. And I made sure that they understood that the experiences I had had with HR led me to be able to say that uh, the f if they wanted to remain anonymous, that would happen. And that before anything was put into motion, uh, they would be asked how they would like to deal with it first. But does that, um, well, I guess that's the steps to changing the culture. Um, but uh, it seems to me that we have to approach our, our, our business, our profession in yeah. a different way. Yeah. I, I think we have to think of ourselves as different people. And that's the thing that, um, to me, has been my, my rallying cry here is to, like, come on, we're professionals at yeah. what we do. Let's just have a professional workplace because everybody that that works with us wants to do a great job. So why don't we produce yeah. that kind of atmosphere then that everybody can really do that? Yeah, I agree as well. Um, and, you know, I think I can't speak for the male chefs who need to help realign the culture within their own kitchens. Um I have certainly worked for some that do, and then I've worked for many similar to you. Um, I've been very fortunate that I've worked in a lot of kitchens where sexual harassment wasn't an issue. Um, and it really does come from the top down. I don't know when or where kitchens became like pirate ships. When that <laughs> <laughs> That is so well put. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know when that became the status right. quo or whether that just became acceptable. Um, you know, Anthony Bourdain's memoir wasn't about how can we make kitchens like this? It was a celebration of the kitchens he came up in. And I think that what, in hindsight, what alarms me is that we all read that uh, tell-all book like as a celebration and not as like a terrifying horror story, which it actually was. And one of the questions that I asked that got cut out of the article, maybe it was too racy, is, you know, what book would we have read if... Um, sexual misconduct was not Anthony Bourdain's like initiation into the kitchen because his one of his first stories is about somebody jamming their fingers in places they don't belong and him retaliating with a meat fork. So, you know, what would his career have looked like if that wasn't his initiation to the kitchen? What book would we have read? What would he be celebrating and what would we be celebrating afterwards? One of the one of the lines from your uh, essay, from your story is, uh, I'll quote here, these jokes are grooming us to become compliant victims and silent observers from the day we walk into professional kitchens. So from the day someone walks into a professional kitchen, the younger version of yourself, as you talked about in that blog, mm -hmm. um, how can they be better equipped or better prepared or feel better about walking into a situation? Yeah, I think that one of the the main audience that I was writing to with this piece was the cooks who are walking into the kitchens because they're the ones who need to be able to say, this isn't really funny. 
Um, and by know. the way, we should point out, and just full disclosure here, the executive, former executive chef Republican Cosmo Goss was fired because there was a, from what I read, there was a picture being passed around and he'd seen it and sort of laughed about it and nothing was done. That was the official public word. And so mm-hmm. he's no longer with the company. Um, so your company clearly is not, there's a, a, a line has been drawn. Yeah, and I'm extremely fortunate to have that as the standard because it could have gone any which way. Um, but I think that that particular scenario is a prime example of this. It's not actually funny. And what the, this joking culture is grooming us for, because how many times do you have to make a joke about genitalia before, you know, somebody's gesture becomes the joke? And then how long of a gesture does it take before, you know, you start touching something else and that's a joke? So, um, and I think the thing that scared me most when all of this went down is wondering to myself, if that picture had been passed around in my presence, would I have done anything? And what scared me is the idea that I'm so numb to this stuff now after years in the industry that I might not have done anything either. Um, That's a really interesting thing. I'm, I'm very... Um I'm a firm believer in many generations in the kitchen. And I think that that is one of the things that, like, you kind of, if you have an older woman in your kitchen, you usually don't do those things in front of the older woman. And I think that the older woman being sort of the, the person in the kitchen that's keeping the, the, the level that everything has to operate in is really good. In our restaurants, in my, in my family restaurant growing up, uh, we had two older women. And you wouldn't say anything in front of them. I mean, sometimes people would like whisper something to each other as a sort of off-color joke or something. But man, you didn't ever. And sometimes they'd come like after you (laughs) (laughs) if they they heard you saying something off-color. And then in in our restaurants here, we have um, uh, all the women that do the tortillas and the tamales and all that sort of stuff. And they tend to be older women that really, boy, everybody bows down with great respect to them. And it makes me think that perhaps at some point in the history of restaurants in the United States, it just became a young person's game, but mostly a young male game. And um, that tends to sort of veer off on, down a path that doesn't necessarily benefit anyone. As she said, a pirate ship. A pirate ship. Yeah, no, a fraternity. It's, exactly. It's like yeah. a fraternity, yes. Yeah. Well, Dana, listen, I, I really appreciate your time yeah. today. We, we love having you here. Thank you for writing the story. Yes, um, thank you. And we thank just you. hope you it's, continue to, to change the help change the workplace. Yeah. Place, make it a better place. Right. Dana Cree is a pastry chef for the Publican Group of Restaurants in Chicago. Again, thanks for stopping by. When we come back, Amanda Cohen, chef and owner of Dirt Candy in New York City, joins us to talk about her piece in Esquire that addressed the issue of harassment in the kitchen. Stay with us. Looking for a little extra side dish? Let us know on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at The Feed Podcast. You're listening to The Feed Podcast. If you like what you're hearing, please rate us on iTunes so others can enjoy the feast. Welcome back to the show, everybody. Anyone can cook a hamburger. Leave the vegetables to the professionals. This is the tagline for Dirt Candy, an award-winning vegetarian restaurant in New York City, and it encompasses chef and owner Amanda Cohen's irreverence for quote-unquote, playing the game to maintain a posh image compared with her reverence for charting her own course and going into the dirt where the real issues and possibilities, like the vegetables on her plates, grow. Dirt Candy is the first vegetarian restaurant in more than 15 years to receive two stars from the New York Times. Now offering tasting menus, Cohen is making the public take her seriously for cuisine and name that some could demean as just a vegetarian restaurant. Her approach is playful. Her bio picture is a unicorn and her cookbook is a graphic novel. But there is a seriousness found in her decision to end tipping, instead including a service charge on the check that is split between front and back of the house employees. This is an attempt to end the income disparities between cooks and servers and raising the wages of all restaurant staff rather than relying on the arbitrary whims of customers. There is seriousness as well in her choice to put the open kitchen in the middle of the restaurant, allowing customers to see the work and workers behind the meals. 
Last November, Cohen joined the conversation on ending sexual harassment in workplaces with a piece in Esquire. It was entitled, I've worked in food for 20 years. Now you finally care about female chefs. We deserved your attention long before sexual harassment made headlines. With a sarcastic, tongue-in-cheek tone, she discusses how the media rarely sheds light on the skills and accomplishments of female chefs, but seems to relish focusing on women as victims. According to Cohen, this narrow reporting limits female chefs' exposure to investors, reinforcing the conditions at the root of the industry's rampant sexual harassment. Amanda Cohen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being with us, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. So tell us, uh, what was the genesis uh, for this article? Esquire reached out to you, or you said you needed to write something because you were just sick and tired of sort of seeing the same stories over and over again? Exactly, to both. Um, I was, uh, like, people were starting to reach out to me, being like, oh, what's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on that? And there was this whole conversation on Twitter uh, where people are like, why aren't more people speaking out? Why aren't we getting more opinions from women chefs and male chefs about what's going on? And I just, I couldn't understand how we were supposed to respond to this. And then Esquire um, very kindly reached out and said, listen, you can write about whatever you want about the situation, but we'd love to hear your voice. And so then that is the piece I wrote uh, in a very cold room in Hungary, actually, while I was there for a conference. And the, the, so the crux of this is that the media just does not do a very good job of balancing coverage. You came up with like 65 women off the top of your head, and yet um, you know, the majority of the food coverage and the awards and the accolades are going to men. Well, yeah. I mean, we see this year after year that the numbers don't lie, and the covers of magazines don't lie. Women don't get the same amount of coverage as men do. And without that coverage, women cannot be cannot attain the same achievements that men have achieved we need the coverage we need the awards we that's how we get the financing to right. open better restaurants like i cannot tell you how much i think all women have sort of felt that you know without this coverage we have been kept down well and i, I think also when organizations give awards like oh this is our award for the female chef um, and that that just goes all over me when I hear that kind of thing because you see that in things like uh, the fifty best list, which I hate is that, yeah. almost I all. I do, but male. you know what? I don't. You don't. I don't hate it. I don't. Tell me and why. I know I'm sort of an out- because without that award, we wouldn't have heard of half the women that we've heard of. Well, so okay. this is a real problem, right? So, yes, that is. You know, yes. I, 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 and I, I wish we didn't have to have that award. To me, it's a necessary evil. But really, I've never heard of Anna Rose beforehand. Uh-huh. Um, she wasn't on sort of, you know, this international playing field uh, that I knew of before she won that award. So how else do we hear about female chefs without that award? Now, the goal is to one day never have that award. But in, until actually there is an even playing field, I don't know what else we do. I don't know right. how we get rid of that award. Without an award, we're never going to hear about women chefs. And bigger than that, that award even though it's probably not the same, is such a financial boon to the women who win it. So right. unless you're in that position, I'm yeah, not I, sure one should be critical. I can understand that. And and this whole financial part of it is really a big part of it, I think, because when you talk about how uh, once you get the recognition that's sort of on equal footing with the men chefs, then you can like attract investors and you can get banks to, to back you and that sort of stuff. But it, it, it is really hard if you're not on equal footing. Well, it is. And you also can make a better restaurant. And this is something for yes. people to sort of recognize. I, I have a restaurant. If I had another million dollars to put into the restaurant, imagine, like I keep imagining what I could do with that. The staff I could hire, the plates I could buy, the drape, the carpet, the tables, all of that, like, and the, the food and the uh, R&D that we could do to make a better restaurant. So without it, we're really kept sort of at this lower level. So, and part of the story goes back to this issue. So, you're saying women would might it might feel easier, or it might be easier to leave an abusive kitchen faster. They wouldn't feel like they have to endure this, the unendurable, as you say, um, if there is more attention paid. If if women are able to go out and get the fundraising for a project as easy as men can. Well, exactly. And if we had other options, wouldn't it be nice if you were a young woman in a kitchen looking around, going, "I hate this asshole chef that I'm working for." But all I can see is another asshole chef at the next restaurant. You know, I would love to go work for a female chef who's going to get the same accolade, who's going to give me the same um, education that I would have had in this kitchen. Instead, 
I don't see that, so I'll just stay here. You, you, but you have actually created that, and your restaurant is, to me, one of the absolute top restaurants in New York. Um, when I have eaten there, I have just been totally blown away. <laughs> uh, one of the best restaurant experiences I've ever had, and I'm sure that you have created a restaurant kitchen environment that is not like the ones that we are hearing about um, in the sh- sexual abuse or misconduct uh, cases. So how did you create that? Well... Um, I think I sort of, I came out at a, a couple of crappy kitchens and I realized that as soon as I was a boss that I, I didn't want to be like the bosses that had come before me. But this is a work in progress. Every day we sort of take a step back and we're like, oh, what can we do better? How are we talking to our staff? What's happening in the kitchen? We're really aware of our surroundings. I don't run a perfect kitchen. Uh, things happen every day that I am not always proud of. But what I am really proud of is that we managed to nip it in the bud like right away. Uh, we just had some, uh, one of my uh, female sous chefs was talking to one of my male line folks and she was like, oh, but he has such cute love handles. And I was like, oh, that's funny, but we can't say that in the kitchen. And we had a huge <laughs> discussion about like what that meant. I was like, okay, let's look at it in the opposite way. What if you, he was saying to you, oh, but you know, you have such cute hips. And she was like, right, I get it. So I don't, people aren't perfect. What you have to do is keep sort of looking at the situation and how you can fix it. And I do have an open kitchen. So that has been sort of this big, huge learning lesson for all of us. You can't be an asshole in front of gas. No, no, no. Like they just don't like it. Um, they're, they're pretty much like right away. They're like, I want to move. I don't want to sit at the counter. You're yelling. And we've had really hard nights where guests have said, wow, it's really intense. You're yelling a lot. I'm like, yes, I am yelling, but it's a very big kitchen. And I need to get the guy who's four people down to listen to me. But I'm, I'm not like saying, you know, you dickhead, move faster. Two, two, stats, <laughs> two stats from your story in Esquire. And I'm going to just quote here. Over the past 12 months, uh, you say the New York Times has written major reviews for 44 restaurants, six of those kitchens run by women. Since 2000, Food & Wine has selected 192 of the best new chefs in America, given them extra coverage, um, a lot of media love, and then 20, only 28 have been women. So I will tell you, Amanda, as a member of the press, I am taking Taking this information to heart, um, and it's no, I think it's and it's a very small step because I'm not the New York Times or Food and Wine magazine. Right. But as someone who writes about food and talks about and broadcasts food in Chicago, I literally now say to myself, I need to balance that playing field a bit more. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think what you've done is is important and impactful. Well, it is the it is the small step, so that makes a huge difference. You know, every small step that somebody takes, somebody else notices, and that's another restaurant that gets on the radar. So that's all we're asking for is an even playing field. Um, I want to compete against the best, not just who's left. All right. Amanda Cohen is executive chef and owner of Dirt Candy in New York City. Amanda, thanks again for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. (laughs) Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Bye. Coming up next week, an ingredient challenge using some seasonal citrus. In the winter, I'm sure Chef Bayless here understands, you have citrus and you have root vegetables. So I use a lot of both in my kitchen. The chef and owner of Owen and Engine accepts our winter citrus challenge as we face off to make an easy weeknight meal in 15 minutes or less using just five other ingredients. That's next week on our show. You can always contact us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Feed Podcast. And you can also check out our ingredient challenges, get recipes, and other information about previous shows by simply visiting our website, thefeedpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe and rate our show on iTunes. Tunes. And don't forget to follow me at Rick underscore Bayless. And I am at Steve Dolinsky. More information about the restaurants and chefs we talked about today on our website as well. Linnea Dominic's our production assistant. Max Dolinsky supervised today's music. Bureaucratic wrote and performed our theme song. And the feed podcast is edited by Matt Cunningham at Truthful Enthusiasm. Whether you're an individual or institution, get your story online with truthfulenthusiasm.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. 